O kia ora nō tātou, tēnā tātou i rotu te ahua tanga nei. Tēnā koe, Chris i mihi mai ki tā tātou nei rangatira Nigel i rotu i te ahua tanga nei. Kia ora, everybody. It's lovely to be here. I think it's lovely to be here. I'm hoping it's lovely to be here. It is lovely to be yeah, here. You know, it's, it's, a tough, it's a tough part of the day to come up here in the afternoon um, and, and, and uh, win people's attention. <laughs> so I could talk about why I think the Japanese should be allowed to go whaling um, in the South Pacific. Should I do that? <laughs> <laughs> I'll get plenty of attention anyway. You want me to sit down? Or I, I, I've got a few remarks to make before Please. we start, if you like. Um, 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 I, um, I run the Māori Fisheries Trust, Te Ohu Kaimona. Uh, the responsibility of the trust is to uh, distribute to the 60 or so tribes in New Zealand, 57 actually, the proceeds of the Māori Fisheries Settlement in 1992. And so for the last 10 years I've been, well, I haven't been doing so much in the last five, but for, the, <laughs> for, for, for most of that 10 years I've been distributing those assets to the tribes and helping them organise themselves so that they can qualify to receive those assets. And by qualify I mean uh, they've got the necessary mechanisms in place to um, ensure that their people's assets are properly looked after and legitimises them as institutions in the eyes of some of the other institutions in New Zealand, so the banks and the, the courts and all those kinds of things know that uh, these assets are being held by legitimate organisations that have got the interests of their beneficiaries at heart. Um, that's been an interesting exercise. Um, uh, I've, um, I've been able to call on all sorts of things that I've done. Um, I was a social worker and I've always found that it's, it's a really good thing to have started out as, as, a, as a worker. It's not, in New Zealand, social workers aren't um, like Dr Melfi and the Sopranos. They're more like um, youth workers. And um, uh, I... I I'm really grateful that I had that opportunity as a young man. Um, I know you're thinking that wasn't long ago, but uh, as a young man to be a social worker and, and to um, and, and to get that sort of experience and satisfaction from that sort of work and be able to build up the sort of empathy you have when you deal with uh, young, young, well, mostly Maori people. Um, the things that um, Yosef has mentioned that I do uh, these days uh, outside of work, I'm the chairman of the Hato Paura. Uh, school, which is a Māori boarding school about two hours from here. Um, about eight years ago, the principal of the school was arrested and charged with sexual assault. And I took over as chairman of the board around about that time. And I ran the school while it took three years for his court case to be held and he was eventually found guilty and imprisoned uh, to employ a new principal to make sure the school ran to get rid of the lousy staff that he had hired to create a whole new set of values and attitudes amongst a new generation of young, young boys, young men, and their families, and the school is thriving. We don't have enough kids. I'm sorry that there's not, a, not very many Māoris here. Chris, if you've got some sons, you better send them to Hatupaura. I know that um, Nigel said he's got one. How old is he? Oh, well, okay, well, that's not too bad. Yeah, <laughs> we need some more boys. Uh, but the school has got a wonderful reputation, you can attest to that, I, I think, Nigel, and, and we've rebuilt that. Um, uh, I'm involved in health, I've got opinions on everything. And what I thought was, is I'd come up here and just talk a little bit about what, uh, the way I see things in regard to the Māori community. You can have a seat, Yosef, I've got a couple more minutes to go. Um, <laughs> Um, that, that I, because what, what, what I'm interested in is being able to talk to people in such a way that they, you can ask the sort of questions that you might have about the Māori people or the Māori communities in New Zealand without being accused of being racist by me. Just because your views might differ to mine, I'm not going to accuse you of that. Um, because I'm, I, I think that the, uh, the social condition of Māori people in New Zealand is our biggest, the biggest issue that we're facing. Now, Nigel made a, a valid point about uh, the $40 billion value in the Māori economy, which is under the stewardship of Māori people. Now, I think that it's a very, it's a two-edged two sword, that, um, uh, that figure. So people like to talk about that as the contribution that Māori make to the New Zealand economy, but if you can't mobilise it, if you can't um, exercise the level of influence that matches up to that level of of participation in the economy, there's little point in, in measuring it and there's little point in talking about it. 
Uh, the Māori population is about 600,000 people in New Zealand. Um, it's like one in seven. Uh, the difference between New Zealand and Australia is the Aboriginal population over there is about a quarter of a million out of 20 million, and we're about six or 700,000 out of four million. So every day you see a Māori. In Australia, every day you don't necessarily see an Aborigine. Um, and I think the sheer weight of our numbers in our country here make it so you can't ignore our issues and our problems. Now, the Māori population, 70% of the population is under 30 years of age. So it's quite a different profile to the rest of the population, which is dominated by the baby boomers um, uh, who are aged about 54, 55, up to about 67, 68 now. And um, uh, within that population, there are some really interesting dynamics. It looks exactly like a um, third world country if you see it on a um, population chart. Um, and the statistics are very similar as well. Although New Zealand's not too bad a place to live. Um, the, um, uh, the condition of Māori people uh, needs quite a lot of attention. So we're half of the prisoners. You know, that sounds terrible, but that's only 4,000. There's only 8,000 prisoners in New Zealand. There's more than that in one state in the United States, I expect. Um, another interesting uh, figure, which I think is really interesting, is, is that in New Zealand, the Pākehā population, uh, the general population, the age of women when they have their first child on average is 29. For the Māori population, it's 19. So in the next 60 years, there's two generations of the general population and three generations of Māoris. But the general population is much bigger, but it's not so much bigger uh, because of that 70% of Māoris being under that age. But it's all, all, all of our social needs, our educational needs are going to be built around that population rather than the three Māori generations. Um, so if you're trying to plan ahead, Nigel, I hope that there's a population plan in New Zealand for you know what age of people we're trying to attract, what sorts of things we're trying to attract in, uh, in terms of immigrants into New Zealand. But what we really need is a way to work out how can you harness the potential that exists in all of those young Māori people under 30 so that they can work and pay taxes to look after all those white folks who are all planning on retiring. Um, now, I'm just a little bit outside the baby boomers. I think you thought I was a lot outside the baby boomers. But, um, you know, uh, the first of the baby boomers in the United States started um, turning 65, I think, in 2011. Um, the same here. And it's all relative from these Western countries, but it's the same sort of impact. What I understand is 10,000 Americans turn 65 every day. And in New Zealand, well, there's not that many, <laughs> but it's all going to be the same rate per our four, four million people. So we've got to work out how do we equip those young people. Now, that example about the dairy farmers, I think, is a really interesting one. I wanted to ask you about it, Nigel. How can we get our young people interested in working as um, herd managers or shepherds on farms in the other parts of the country? The money's pretty good. It's like a 1000 bucks a week. But we can't get kids out of Auckland or Hamilton or Gisborne to go and work in dairy farms. But we are able to bring people from the Philippines and South America. So maybe we need an agency that gets a fee for bringing kids from Auckland, just like the ones who get it from kids from the Philippines. I, I don't know. I mean, I know that there's all sorts of externalities that are going to make that difficult. But why can't we get those kids interested? Because we're not talking about kids who can't be bothered working. We're talking about kids that they just don't see that as part of their um, uh, as part of their future. Anyway, that's just a little bit of an introduction. I, I um, why do I think Japanese should go whaling? Um, I, I do. I do believe that. The Japanese want to catch whales because they eat them. All the people who don't want them to catch whales come from communities that caught whales for oil. That's why I think Japanese should be able to catch whales. Terrible, eh? Killed everybody. You didn't like that as a, as a, as a finishing note? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that, Peter. One of the questions I have for you is around uh, aspects of the values and, and concepts of stewardship 
that are present within Maori communities that we can learn from? What has been your experience uh, and observations in, in such communities that perhaps are not uh, as prominent in, in the way that Western societies have been developing so far? Mm. Well, well, my most recent experience in the fisheries is that um, uh, we, we, we don't actually own 50% of the fisheries, it's about 40, um, but we don't exercise 40% of the influence. But we've got 40% of the commercial assets, we probably number about 30 or 40 percent of the recreational fishing um, fraternity community, and we're 100 percent of the customary fishing uh, component in New Zealand. And what what happens for someone like me, who's got to, to be involved in all of those things, um, you can't ignore the customary aspects, the recreational aspects. Um, you can't have them uh, suffer at the uh, just in order to get great dividends from the commercial side of things. So having that span of interest means that you have to apply to your commercial entities some of the values that you have in your customary ones. Um, so you, you, you and there's a, and there's, of course there's a backdrop of environmental um, sustainability and responsibility that we've got to deal with as well. So you try and work out ways that you can have a commercially successful company that incorporates some of the values that you would um, you would bring from your own communities, um, and um, you know there's good and bad sides about it in terms of our our, our circumstances. We're not um, so far advanced in terms of our experience in the fishing industry as of late that we can't bring those sorts of um, values into the way we do business. And earlier you were talking a lot about. Um the challenges that the youth population is facing the, within Māori communities. Yeah. Can you talk a little more about what are some of the specific challenges that, that such communities are facing? Okay, well, um, it wasn't so long ago that when Labour was in government, Trevor Mallard was the Minister of Education. And uh, he said at one stage that, you know, the, the statistics about New Zealand education system, whereas it was one of the best in the world, if it weren't for the Māori component in the... Um, uh, in, in the education statistics. Now there's two issues there. One is that the Māori statistics um, are that bad and the other is that the Minister of, Mo of Education thinks it's okay for him to talk about a big part of the population as though they're not part of the New Zealand education system, that they're somehow part of the Māori education system. So there's a whole lot of things that make that happen. Um, you know, Māori people have got a lot more in common with the rest of New Zealand than they have got indifference. Um, so we're much, you know, New Zealanders, Māoris, non-Māoris, they have uh, got a lot more in common than people um, may recognise until they meet up overseas. But a lot of our education initiatives in the Māori community or a lot of our initiatives in any number of, of uh, areas are about a particularly Māori way of doing things. So it might be the Māori language medium, uh, for education, it might be Māori boarding schools like the one I run and those types of things which give people the sense that we want to do all of our things separately from the rest of the community when the great majority of Māori kids go to schools that everybody else goes to schools at. But we've got to make sure that we can turn around the statistics in all of those schools, not just the ones that are run by Māori organisations because the, the huge majority of Māori kids go to school in the same school as everybody else. So I, I think that you know, there's a lot of effort from people to try and um, accommodate um, some of the Māori initiatives, but the problem with them is, is that they are the, the purview of the middle class Māori, so that those, those people who are prepared to go to all of that effort, and there's such a big group of the Māori population that's left out of it. Now that's not to say they're all terrible. Most Māoris are working, most Māoris are raising their families well, but there's a, there's a big part of them that you know, needs a lot of attention. Half of Māori kids these days are brought up in a single parent home. Now, that's a lot. I have a lot more questions for you, but I'd like to open it up to people from the audience who might have some thoughts. Hi, I'm Christopher. I got one question, which is, I guess, pretty much for the open audience. What's the presence of Maori in the tech sector here? 
Is there any? And if not, is there a plan to have them? I, I can't, I'm sorry, Chris, I can't tell you what, 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 the, what the presence or the proportion of them are. Oh, you can. I can, oh, yeah. Um, it, it's not too bad. Uh, I think that the, the broad issue that we've got in uh, the New Zealand schools and skill system for the tech sector and what's often reflected back to us is that we're probably overproducing uh, still lawyers, accountants, people doing commerce degrees. What we're undercooking is people not doing science, technology, engineering, math. And that I think the big challenge is for our education system, if we're sort of looking at what's being presented as some of the world, world leading best practice in terms of, you know, the future of jobs, which I think, you know, as we grapple and realise just the pace at which technology is changing, you know, what in a generation will be the types of skills that you need to have, is that the, that the school system, probably a lot of the starts back in uh, when kids are 10, 11 and, and year 8, year 9, uh, the sort of quality, the investments that we're making in, in uh, schools, in teaching, and I think those are, those are some of the big challenges that we've got to grapple with broadly in terms of um, sort of skills and probably some big questions about whether our skill system's actually um, delivering people that have got the skills that ultimately employers are uh, are looking for. So that's what I'd say, the broader challenges in there. But yeah, general message is we're not producing enough people um, you know, for, for the tech, tech sector in terms of the skill set the tech sector are telling us we need to uh, meet. And I don't think we've got really a, a, a mouldy element to that that um, yeah, is different from just the, the general issue. Uh, thanks, Peter. I uh, really appreciate the, the candor and remarks that, that you've, you've brought. And my, my question is a follow-on to that, which is, you know, there's a lot of entrepreneurs in the room, and we, we think about, you know, job creation and, and where to align that with the types of goals that New Zealand has around uh, training and development of skill sets, as well as where there, there are actual needs within the population set. And I'm, I'm curious from your experiences within the education side of things, and, and as well culturally, you know, we see a lot of opportunities on the high tech skill side. We also see a lot of opportunities um, in terms of as we seek to pioneer collectively new ways of regenerating and restoring the environment and new, new methods for food production and other sorts of restoration. Um, there's a lot of new skills that, that happens there. And I'm just wondering if there are any nuanced um, ideas or, or sets of guidance you can provide us with in terms of what types of jobs may resonate most within the Maori community and how might uh, we as entrepreneurs uh, specifically create those bridges um, which, which could in turn hopefully help um, with some of the poverty issues and, and some of these other um, community bridges that, that might be formed? Yeah. Well, look, I, I think that's a really um, a good question. But the, the, uh, the issues for me are, because I, I think that the tech area, the STEM area, is, it's, it's a real sexy area for everybody to be concentrating their efforts in these days. Um, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm, I don't want to discourage that. I just don't want all the attention to be heading those ways when there are, you know, we, we're importing uh, many thousands. I mean, there's about 12,000 dairy farms in New Zealand, is that right? And we've got thousands of people from the Philippines and South America working on these farms. And I think, I think there's 5,000 in the South Island. That's five million bucks a week. Um, and yet we can't work out a way to get our own young people into that just so that they can get a work ethic that they can then exercise in New Zealand rather than, than um, selling their skill and their efforts in Australia. Because if you go to Australia, um, a Māori kid getting off an aeroplane can get a job in a, in a few hours because they've got such a reputation for industry and hard work. Um, and how we could gen translate that energy and that into this this sector is what we should be looking at. But in our own country, we've got a reputation for idleness, and um, and I don't I don't think that that's well uh, grounded um, uh, reputation. I don't think it's a fair one. But I do think that there must be ways that we can harness the 
enthusiasm and the and the energy that the young people that are prepared to go to Australia to seek their fortunes, uh, they might be able to do that in our own country. Now, I think that what you'll find with the tech industry is that um, you know the middle class Maori kids are going to be just as keen on learning this area as the middle class non Maori kids, and you know, all power to them. And I think that if we can work out ways to make uh, well, to give them a chance to understand the sort of experiences that you you have yourselves, or or the opportunities that might exist for them, then that's a great opportunity. I took a group from Hatupaura to Los Angeles last year, and Leon Grice arranged for us to spend the evening with him at his. He's the general counsel for for foreign affairs over there, and he had all these people from the film industry, and the kids. You know, these boys are sort of 16, 17, 18, and they just met up and talked to people who'd been involved in movies that they've seen and that they have, they can identify with. And they just come back thinking, man, I could, I could, I could do that sort of thing. But, you know, we, if we didn't take them to Los Angeles, they'd never have experienced that sort of thing. The next day, of course, we walked through the shitty parts of downtown Los Angeles and they thought, oh shit, it's not all malls and sneakers over here, is it? There is some other elements to the Los Angeles lifestyle. Uh, that we should know about as well. So. I think it's a really useful insight is, is how do we inspire, especially given that demographics, how do we inspire that growing number of young people um, to co-create some of these solutions in areas where there are there is a lot of potential for the country and in the world. Um, any final remarks before we close? Um, wh why is there that gap? Why are the young Maori's not doing the agricultural work. Well, I I, um, I think that's got a bit to do with how far away it is. I mean, it's um, if you live in Auckland, then the idea of moving all the way down to um, Southland or Invercargill might be a bit daunting. But they don't have to move all that far. You can get a job in Taihapu. But I don't think that there's the proper incentive for people who recruit those that labour to go off and find uh, those kids out of Auckland. So in Auckland, you know, there'll be a new supermarket opens up and there's hundreds of people who are lining up for jobs working in the supermarket, which you all know isn't, you know, you don't have to be that skilled. But there are nobody who's interested in going to work on these farms in, in the other parts of the country. Now, when you bring people over from the Philippines, um, there's an agency fee that's involved in that. And um, people make a lot of money out of importing and bringing in temporary um, workers from other parts of the world. Now, I know a little bit about this because we were criticised for our, well, for having a role in the um, uh, foreign charter vessels, which we don't have a role in. But <laughs> uh, if you're 40% of the fishing industry, you've got to take some of that blame as well. But I think that um, if you had a system that was akin to the um, uh, the system that that creates that level of agency for people to import workers and get make money out of it, then they'll start looking in different parts of the country instead of different parts of the world. It's not that the um, that the cows all speak Spanish, so we need people from South America or, or something. You know, it's 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 not that. It's not that level of, um, and and you know, we're not talking about. It's tough work, but we're not talking about jobs that are beyond the the young people who live in live in Auckland, but the incentives aren't there for people to recruit them. I think that's a really good insight, and especially as we move to 2050 and, and uh, you know, the move to the cities, 75% of people globally are going to be living in cities by 2050, so not a, a problem unique to New Zealand, but something which is going to be really interesting and that we need to find creative solutions for globally. So final comment reflection here. Thank you. I want to thank you for thinking of this, and uh, you know, the, uh, your I see, I feel your care for the Maori people, and uh, you want for the way to, to help them. And just from a totally different perspective, since that's what this dome is about, uh, what if they intrinsically feel that the farms that are being, you know, the dairy farms are not good for the land? Like the previous speakers said that that actually there's a lot of off run that the whole milk industry might not be actually the one that's necessary for the land. So what if they're, because th these people, as I understand, they're very connected and plugged into the land itself. They're not playing the game of the what's money, not money. They want to they want what's in, in integrity, what's in truth. So perhaps you can't get them to these farms because the farms, the way the farms are run, are not how they were, what they want. If it was, let's say, permaculture, 
that is taking incongruent with what the land is, that is also congruent with the economy is, perhaps they might have more incentive to come and work. I think that's a nice thing to say, but I don't know that. I don't know that that's. I mean, our young people are happy to go to Australia and go mining, um, but we are not happy to have mining in our own country. We're not happy to have farming over here. I I, I, th I think that you know when you're when you're 18 and 19, um, getting an opportunity to work is a really, you know, it's a really valuable thing. Work and the routine of work is a valuable part of any community, and if, if if we've got a situation where too many of our young people don't experience that in their own country, I can't. I don't think it's going to be a well. They don't, they're not going to end. They're either going, not going to end up living here, or they're going to end up resenting uh, the rest of the community. Mm. Mm. One last uh, question from my end is: We have a lot of uh, many of us who are new to New Zealand, and who are learning so much about. Uh, this place and the indigenous community. What advice do you have uh, for us to discover the Maori world and to start understanding uh, what the values are, what, what the ways of living are, and, and build greater empathy? Well, you don't have to be an, a refugee to get uh, force-fed. Uh, um, I was thinking, those poor refugees, they come all the way from some wretched part of the world and then they have to go and learn all of these things. But all the other immigrants don't. Um, I think that, you know, the fact that you want to learn about um, New Zealand and Māori society is a great start. And, you know, it's a pretty miserable, um, stone-hearted person that'll turn you away if you ask them. Like, if you ask me, I'm not going to say, look, yeah, i got no time for you you guys, or something like that. I mean, I, th you, I think you're going to find people are people, and they're happy to talk about their world with, with people from anywhere else. And because they, I, I think that if you're going to be approaching them the way you sound like you'll be approaching them, you know, so they're not going to think, well, why does he want to know this from me? You don't sound like you're after something. So, you know, people, people are people and they'll, they'll be happy to share their information and their world with you. Are there books or uh, Yeah, we got books. We got books. Uh, like any, any recommendations? <laughs> watch Māori TV. Yeah, watch Māori TV and read books. Um, but, but, you know, you get a lot more from just talking to people. So. Thank you very much for that, Peter. Really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you very much.